after the fact because people can be busy. And um, now that it's 636 and John has his tech on, uh, I'm going to give him an introduction. I've known John for a long time. John has been involved in transportation policy in New York a hell of a lot longer than I have been uh, from his uh, early days, I think, with uh, Tri-State Transportation Campaign. That was before you became Executive Director of Transportation Alternatives? No, after. It was after? Okay. Um, John, John um, was doing a lot of the heavy lifting and a lot of the heavy policy work behind the transformation wrought under the second and third Bloomberg terms under Jeanette Sedek Khan's administration at the Department of Transportation with respect to bike share, uh, with respect to traffic calming measures and bike infrastructure, with respect to some of the pedestrianization, pedestrianization initiatives. Um, John has really left his mark uh, on New York City in a way that few people have. And so it's therefore remarkable that he is so little known, but a testament to his humility that, uh, that that's the case. <laughs> he also loves to bike, uh, not only just in general, but um, I understand uh, he's a pretty accomplished uh, racer as well uh, out at Floyd Bennett Field. Um, so I think he has a tremendous amount to share for our group here at um, New York Cycle Club with people who love the bike, who uh, many of whom enjoy racing. And we have our new racing division within the club that, that we were trying to promote until a certain virus came along. And for all of us who are scratching our heads and trying to figure out where we fit into things and how we kind of hold our city together, with all of these rolling crises that are, are kind of sweeping through the pandemic, the, the sort of coming to consciousness over police misconduct, which was a long festering problem that was neglected for too long, the dramatic fiscal crisis that's been triggered by the pandemic, um, and, and all of the attendant issues. Uh, we're really kind of at an inflection point and it's really at this time we need to go to um, people who have the long perspective, like John, who've been thinking about transportation policies for so long and spend their, I think, all their waking hours, you know, uh, uh, consulting information feeds from the four corners of the earth uh, about what other cities and other countries are doing to try to navigate some of the same crises we're facing here in New York. And, and, and they're getting some very different answers and taking some very different approaches than we seem to be here in New York. Um, so that's all by way of framing. I'm just going to leave it to you, John. Thanks. Um, cool. Thank you, Steve, so much. And thanks to everyone who's, um, who's logged in and, and is uh, you know, here for this conversation. I have some stuff I want to present um, just to give my sort of point of view of where we are today. And <clears throat> what I'll do is I will try to whip through those things pretty quickly. I can talk fast and I can show pictures quickly. So let me do that. And then we can get into more of a conversation about it. Um, let's see if I'm, Steve, can you guys, can you see these slides now? Yes. Title slide. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the pandemic is presenting a really interesting situation that we had not expected at all, of course, at the beginning of 2020. Um, and that is because people are riding bikes in unprecedented numbers in New York now. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's showing a couple of things. One, we need to respond and help those people. Many of them are new cyclists. Many of them um, took to bikes in the spring when we were enjoying very low traffic conditions that um, certainly are not uh, still the case in, say, my part of Brooklyn. I'm sitting in Greenpoint. Um, Manhattan is a little quieter still, I think, than normal, but Brooklyn is not. And, and I think people are showing that they're, they're taking to cars in huge numbers to avoid transit. Um, I rode across the borough around 4.30 this afternoon, and it was really um, like normal rush hour in Brooklyn and maybe a bit worse with, with traffic. So not only do we need to help people who are trying bikes and using bikes, um, because it's been a city policy for a long time 
to at least say that we're promoting um, bike riding as uh, you know, efficient use of space, sustainable transportation, good for health, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> but we're also showing what the city could be if we do give people those low traffic conditions and we do give people safe places to ride. And we really need to, as a cycling community, to, um, to embrace that, grab hold of it, and really push it hard as, as you know, yet another argument for why New York could be one of the world's cycling capitals. Um, the Times ran this piece in early July, and I, I really love the headline because it asked the question that I've been, you know, grappling with for, you know, 30 some years. Um, what, what is it going to take to make us a bike friendly place? What is it going to take to to take the incredible density that we have and the transit and walking orientation that we have and translate that over to bikes? Um, and, you know, in this 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 Times article and the, the reporter was was great and very thorough. Um, you know, sort of took the, uh, the fact that she could find bike shop owners saying, look, we did two years of business during May. Um, we did two to three years business during May, and now we're having trouble finding stuff to sell people. Um, taking that situation and then broadening it out to the sort of policy questions are how do we preserve the space that we're now finding to ride bikes in, in the city? And how do we um, make this really work when you know, when people start going back to offices, which is starting to happen. I, I have friends who are starting to spend a few days a week in Manhattan at their office. Um, and how do, how do we do that? Uh, and I'm actually quoted in the piece saying, um, so far we're really blowing the crisis as far as biking is concerned. Concerned Because by early July, it was clear we weren't, we weren't gonna get a kind of quick response to really uh, grab some of the street space and link it up into the better connected bike, work, bike network um, that ordinary people need to ride in, in a crowded city uh, and that we didn't have a real programmatic answer um, and that we, we were actually seeing in some other um, world capitals, uh, certainly certainly by May, if, if not June and July. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's the good, a good framing for this conversation and, and it's still a good framing um, as we sort of engage our public officials this fall and this winter, and then certainly next year during the mayoral race, um, what is it going to take for us to finally become a bike city? Um, the New Yorkers themselves are showing, you know, what some of those ingredients are, and it's mainly safe places to ride. So just to recap where we were before we, you know, met this sort of crazy, weird, unprecedented situation. Um, <clears throat> you know, the city, the city under Bill de Blasio has a, an aggressive traffic safety policy. Um, it has a bike program. It's been putting out a lot of mileage of um, protected bike lanes. Uh, you know, it's not a very well connected set of protected bike lanes and um, it's clashing, you know, very much with the rise of Uber and the, the resurgence of uh, car traffic in our city. The, uh, you know, the, the dr dramatic increase of delivery trucks on our streets, all these other trends. Um, we're adding up to a, a really deadly 2019 where we saw 19 people killed riding bikes on our streets. And, you know, a real outcry from our community. This is the, uh, the July um, die-in in, in uh, Washington Square Park, uh, where we really put the mayor on notice that, you know, we had to get more. Uh, we had to do more to protect ourselves. We couldn't, he couldn't just keep <clears throat> resting on his laurels from 2013 and 14 saying we're going to embrace vision zero and, you know, really, you know, change the trade-offs and dramatically in favor of street safety. You know, we've seen some progress in that regard. I don't think it really lives up to a kind of radical vision zero city at the moment and certainly not last year. Um, but we got some new plans and some new recommitments from the city out of this uh, crisis last year, um, including a new plan to really, you know, put out more um, mileage of protected bike lanes, um, more attention to bike parking, et cetera. And, you know, we had seen a lot of, um, a lot of sort of areas of, of policy sort of fall away uh, with the exception of uh, the city's focus on bike lanes. Um, <clears throat> and at Bike New York, I've been trying to bring more of that back uh, so that we're, you know, sort of pursuing a more holistic and integrated strategy around cycling in the city. Nonetheless, you know, I think, you know, in terms of the bike lanes that we do get in the city, you know, the painted, the paint stripe lanes have sort of, I think, served their purpose over the last 10 or 12 years. And they're, they're really, you know, not, not terribly useful. Now we know 
they're going to fill up with cars immediately. And, you know, and with the double parking, the Uber drop-offs, the, the truck traffic, you know, they're just, they're just completely overwhelmed and they don't create new bike riders. Um, the protected bike lanes, you know, where we do basically take a moving lane and protect the, um, protect the bike lane with a lane of parking, they're working pretty well and, and, they, and they've, they're kind of time tested. And, and we're getting more new ones of those. There's one on Sixth Avenue that's in, in progress now. There are a variety of them um, in different parts of the city, Flatbush Avenue, Fourth Avenue, um, parts, of, uh, parts of Crescent Street in Astoria, to name a few. Um, <clears throat> Steve? Yeah, I'm just gonna jump in because um, knowing our audience here at the New York Cycle Club, you probably know them pretty well too, John. What I hear often about protected bike paths from road cyclists, which is the bulk of the membership of NYCC, people who identify that way, is that um, they are more dangerous than driving with the, you know, than riding with the motor vehicles um, because you're trapped and there's too many hazards and the condition of the roadway is more dangerous towards the margin than it is towards the vehicular lanes and people don't like to use them and they, they avoid them and they feel almost as if when a bike lane, when a protected bike path is put on a route they have to use, they have to detour around it. Um, I have devoted probably thousands of hours to getting protected bike lanes put in <laughs> because I believe in them. But what would you say to the people who have that view? Well, look, statistically, it's not the case that they're more dangerous than unimproved streets. Um, they're a lot safer from uh, any kind of accounting of bike crashes on those streets in terms of the both before and after. Um, and they do generate a lot of new cyclists. We've seen that. Um, we've seen that to be the case. And look, frankly, you know, every bike racer I know who goes from Brooklyn up to the George Washington Bridge, they take the west side path. And that's a little different than a parking protected bike lane. But it's just a lot, it's just a lot more relaxed to be amid um, other bike riders and pedestrians than to be duking it out with traffic for, you know, for 200 blocks. Um, so look, if you don't want to be in the protected bike lane, that's fine. And yes, we are looking at some real capacity problems with some of our bike infrastructure today, especially on the bridges. But I'd say also, you know, the east side bike lanes um, today at rush hour can feel very crowded and it can be hard to pass. Um, but, you know, I don't know, I use them a lot and I don't mind relaxing in those lanes. Um, at the time, and I'm perfectly willing to duke it out with traffic when I need to as well. Um, but look, here's the problem. We, um, we have these bike lanes and they do um, serve uh, commuter and transportation cyclists just fine, except that they are often, often, often blocked with other things that aren't bikes. And that's including the protected bike lanes. So this is a little bit of a um, sensationalist photo for this article, but what it's really about is a Hunter College observational study um, the best one we've seen yet, which says even protected bike lanes are blocked at least at once every 10 blocks, according to their, you know, broad set of uh, observations that were released, sadly, like right before Thanksgiving last fall. So they didn't get, it didn't get much play. Um, but it really just confirms what all of us experience when we're using those lanes, is, which is that um, we don't have a design that keeps cars out. We don't have a car proof design. We don't have enforcement that, that could do the same thing that the physical lane isn't doing. Um, either way, um, we're not getting the job done. And there's, you know, there's some very, very serious design compromises that really keep our bike network from functioning um, much, much better and, and really creating that safe space that um, people are responding to this year with much lower traffic, um, at least during the spring and early summer. So, you know, even in places where we've pushed hard to get more robust barriers, um, the city has all kinds of operational rules about street sweepers and emergency vehicle access that make the bike lanes so big that a truck can fit in them. These are bike lanes so big, you know, uh, that you can drive a truck through it. And so the trucks drive through it and they park in it and use them for delivery zones. So, you know, look, why do we go through these, you know, brutal battles at the community level and all the technical work to do these things um, when we just end up like this? Um, these are the, some of the issues we were grappling with in 2019, before New Yorkers took to bikes, you know, in record numbers, uh, you know, even as we were expanding this network, there were conflicting signals about what was going on with cycling in the city. Um, city bike, for example, saw record ridership in 2019, um, but the city's traditional counts on these river bridges of bike riders 
actually peaked in 2016 and went down for each of the next three years um, before turning around this year in, in dramatic fashion. But, um, you know, there was some sense that uh, we weren't actually, you know, on top of it and continuing the, the good trend that we had seen since the mid 2000s um, for more and more people riding bikes in town. Um, <clears throat> and we had started to really dig into some of these issues with the city council. Um, it, was, it was very hard to get the administration's, you know, attention on any of these kind of issues, but um, policy making it really shifted heavily towards the city council. And we were starting to dig into these things, um, you know, even with people who weren't on the transportation committee, but on the sanitation committee, in terms of some of these operational rules that were compromising our bike lane designs. And really, as I said, trying to get back on top of some of these issues that had gone by the wayside um, during the sort of vision zero focus. Um, why are we installing only, you know, a third of the bike racks that we're installing? Um, you know, five, six years ago, why are we installing the same number of bike racks as Seattle installs every year when our city is eight times the size of Seattle? Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we got some response partly because of the, the high profile of all the fatalities, but partly because of um, the fact that the council was really willing to take, you know, the reins on policy. So the council under uh, Speaker Johnson, Corey Johnson's leadership, in November passed the street master plan legislation, which called for a big step up in terms of the numbers of bike lanes we put out each year um, and some other things that, that would sort of reduce the car orientation of the streetscape. Um, there are, you know, there are unresolved budget issues around some of the targets in there. There are quality issues that still need to be grappled with the things I've just been talking about in terms of the bike lanes. Um, there are agencies other than DOT, as I mentioned, sanitation, certainly the police, um, parks, EDC, others who, um, who really affect the streetscape um, that would need to be brought into this tent. But it was a big start and a big change. Um, the way the law was written, you know, in negotiation with the mayor really wouldn't be a, a task or something undertaken by city government until the next administration. Some people criticized it for that. I think it's good. I think it's good with this kind of um, legislation, partly, which I think is partly designed to get past the kind of, um, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat you see over bike lanes at community boards and other forums um, to sort of say, look, this is the city's policy to become bike friendly. We're going to do this. We'll engage with communities about how to do it, but there's no longer a veto granted to communities. Um, I think it's better to give that to the new mayor in 2022 than to have uh, the de Blasio people sort of try to make sense of it in terms of their own um, willingness to engage every single complaint and to go sort of foot by foot with, uh, with community boards on, on how the streets should look. Um, but anyway, we don't know what this is gonna look like um, post pandemic, but it is where we were sort of at the end of last year, looking ahead to um, you know, a bigger bike network, a better connected bike network, um, and hopefully more focus on quality, although that still remains to be seen. But, you know, coming into this year, here's a shot of what is usually totally jam-packed um, bike path along Kent Avenue, um, just south of where I live in Williamsburg. Um, it was a ghost town throughout April. Um, the lockdown, the pandemic fears, everything, you know, everything that, you know, we all lived through um, had just sort of, you know, evacuated our streets for a while. And, uh, and we were sort of transitioning into um, a very new period um, but what's interesting is as people tried to make sense of it, um, they took to bikes in huge numbers, as we've seen. Um, you know, anybody can talk to their bike shop uh, people, their, you know, their, their mechanics, their people across town. I think, you know, one of the real advocacy wins that we had was with the governor's office at the beginning of all the, uh, the restrictions in March, April, which was getting bike shops declared as essential uh, businesses so that there wasn't somebody foreclosing your ability to stock up on inner tubes or to get the tune up or to, <laughs> to get that town bike out of the, um, out of the storage room and, and, uh, and dust it off, you know, because people were not going to be using the subways and buses nearly as much. And even today, we're still at like 75% of normal bus ridership. I mean, not 75%, 25% um, and about 20% of normal subway ridership, even with a bit of a, a resurgence in, in August. So, um, you know, that, that, that's what we started to see. Um, but what we also started to see, and, and Steve alluded to this at the outset, um, is 
global capital is starting to say, you know, we're seeing the exact same thing from our citizens. People are not going to use public transportation. We have essential workers who have to get around or want to get around. Um, we saw this in China as well. Um, bike share was um, maintained even with the traveling public basically on lockdown in a lot of cities. Bike share was maintained as an essential service for medical workers and the other people that had to move around the cities. Uh, and it was, you know, subject to new disinfection rules and things like that. But so anyway, we started to see these new models. Berlin called it the 10 day bike lane. Um, you go from concept to execution in 10 days uh, and you start to just put in these things. Um, you know, these are different street furniture than we we're used to in New York. These are just these sort of visible panels bolted into the street with a bit of paint. Um, London at key points, um, you know, it's different in different parts of London. It has, a, you know, a bunch of different borough governments which have some power over local streets. So we're seeing all kinds of different models, but at key points, they're putting in these nice linear barriers, um, which is something, um, you know, we've been sort of calling for since the spring in New York. And Paris just phenomenally, you know, doubled down on what it was already doing for cycling. Um, you know, the mayor had said, Look, we're we're really moving from cars to bikes on our on our surfaces and 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 buses as well. And she was in the midst of a re-election campaign this spring and early summer, and she said, "Look, we can't go back to the way our streets were. We're going to um, use the fact that we're doing this to double down." Paris had already seen a doubling of its bike uh, ridership numbers in 2019, partly thanks to a transit strike at the end of the year. But she, of course, because... being Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris. Sorry. She being Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris. Yes, yeah, sorry, to name, to name the mayor who's just been reelected to a new, another six year term. And um, it'll be amazing to see what the city is like at the end of uh, 2025. Um, but they basically just closed a bunch of streets to cars, um, created a lot of bike priority districts and um, sort of filtered situations where um, you can't get a car through, but you can get a, a bus or a bike through. Um, you know similar in parts of London and, and the mayor of London has also said, look, we're gonna be doing these things over time anyway. Let's take advantage of the fact that we have low traffic and the fact that people are using bikes anyway in huge numbers and do it more quickly. Do it a little quick and dirty at first, but then we will come back and, and do it better um, going forward. So we're really seeing a sort of pop-up culture around different cities in, in the world, leading cities, um, and this, this um, you know, sort of summary of what's going on in, in Milan, in Northern Italy, sort of says it all. They, they had a plan on the books. A lot of this is couched in the idioms of climate, um, better communities, uh, traffic safety. Um, but they, they basically said they're going to build their six-year plan out this year, um, and they're doing it. Um, <clears throat> also, some really interesting institutional changes um, in different places, especially in Germany. Um, looking at, you know, right turn on red for bikes, you know, the kinds of things that um, just make sense if you're really, you know, digging into bike transportation and the kind of legal infrastructure behind a lot of that stuff. So these things were all sort of cracked open and done, looked at very quickly. You can see the date on this tweet it was from April. Um, meanwhile, in New York, we sort of had a fight over, <laughs> can we even get some social distancing on the street? And the mayor sort of acceded to that, you know, demand, which was early on. Begrudging. Um, and they did, they did a very heavily policed sort of um, very small set of streets in different places. This is the example on Park Avenue. And they did it for a couple of weeks. And they said, look, it's, it's a lot of cops and it's, you know, cold and people aren't coming out and I don't know, whatever. And, <clears throat> and then they canceled it. And, they, you know, they got very bad press. Um, this is New York Magazine, of course. Um, and there was an outcry really about this, saying, look, again, the world is doing this and we are New York City and we are not doing it. It's not that long ago that the world was coming to New York to look at protected bike lanes and pedestrianization of Times Square and, you know, a variety of new changes uh, that were happening very quickly. Uh, and now we're kind of in a following position and, you know, we're not used to that. And um, the council, again, took the reins and said, this is not okay. And there was kind of a showdown hearing between the council, the police department, and the DOT at the end of April. And within a couple of weeks, um, it, you know, and I think 
one of the key things was that the council reached out to the governor's office and the governor started making noises about forcing, you know, more social distancing space in the city. And so we got a big open streets program um, announced by the mayor very quickly within, uh, you know, within two weeks of the council hearing. And so the mayor said, look, we're going to do 100 miles of open streets. We're even going to throw in some pop-up bike lanes and Bike New York and Transportation Alternatives and Brooklyn Greenway Initiative and some others had asked in March for a pop-up bike lane program. And the city had sort of come through with a couple, one on J Street in Brooklyn and one um, on 2nd Avenue in Manhattan past the mouth of the Midtown Tunnel, one of the notorious sort of bike network gaps um, where there was a protective bike lane on either side of it, but you know nothing where you really needed the help from the heavy turning traffic. Um, and those were put in and they weren't great, um, but the city said they were gonna do more. And so, you know, we thought that was hopeful and good. And the, the open streets have been a huge success and very popular in much of the city. Um, meanwhile, let's, you know, let's take a quick look at what was happening with bikes. Um, Manhattan Bridge, um, clearly in April, people stayed home and didn't move around too much. But as people realized they had to get out and do things and there was an opportunity, um, we saw a real rebound in the bridge counts. Um, as I said, bridge counts had peaked in 2016, went down in 17, 18, 19. Um, but we're now seeing all time highs on our bridge bike paths, um, starting in, you know, starting with May, May being the sort of crossover month and then, you know, continuing to new records in the summer. Um, City Bike, I mentioned, had seen a record 2019, um, but even without, you know, basically the destruction of office commuting and no tourism, um, City Bike saw its busiest ever July this year and uh, August ridership equivalent to what it saw the year before, um, they reported their busiest day of all time just a couple of days ago this, this month. September is often the peak bike month, my, uh, bike riding month in the city in terms of any bike counts. So uh, I think we'll see, you know, continued bike boom into the fall. Also interesting is um, in spite of the bridge counts going up, we're seeing even bigger increases on some of the newer bike counters that the city has started to put into bike lanes away from the bridges. So we're seeing, um, and, and, and I see this and a lot of you probably do as well, more bike riding in your neighborhood, less on commuter routes, but more between adjacent neighborhoods, um, you know, just getting around. So this is Prospect Park West. We saw a much bigger percentage increase and, and actually a shallower uh, lockdown dip in April than we saw on the commuter routes. Um, not surprising, it's kind of confirming what I think a lot of people are seeing. I'm starting to dig into numbers now for like Kent Avenue, Pulaski Bridge versus the Williamsburg Bridge, and I expect to see something very similar, Steve. I was just going to ask you a quick question because this is something that's bothered me for a while. The traditional methodology of measuring cycling in the city has been the screen line counts administered by DOT, where they look and see how many cyclists are passing through the commuter corridors into the central business districts um, at, on selected days. But many suggest, and I think it's true that, um, but there are many bike trips that are important that need to be counted in order to understand um, the rate of cycling in general in the city that are not commuter trips and are not captured by that screen line methodology. Um, as someone who worked at DOT, I mean, you know, what do you think? Do, does the screen line story about declining bike ridership from 2017, 2018, and 2019, is that a bad measurement or did that really happen? I don't know. I don't know. We don't have enough data points to know. Um, you know, City Bike is the best count in the city because it counts every single trip and you get a hard machine count from their system every day. Um, and, and in fact, every, you know, every minute. Um, so what's happened um, since I worked there is the city has started to put a lot more in-street counters into different corridors. I picked Prospect Park West as the first one of those to take a look at. We just got the data posted online on December 31st. So we couldn't get this data until this year. Um, and we, and I, I pushed for it all last year. Um, so it's finally part of the city's open data policy. So we're making progress there. So there's now about 17 counters in the street 
um, in the city, including the East River bridges. Um, but but uh, again, most of them are in Manhattan. Some of them are still on the screen line, I think partly to calibrate the old screen line counts. So there's a bunch of them on, uh, on different avenues at 50th Street, which was one of the old counts. Um, but there are now some that are further from the Central Business District. So Prospect Park West is one of them. Um, there are newer ones up on, um, I want to say like 78th and Columbus, 78th and Amsterdam. They don't have, they're pretty new, so I don't have less, like any numbers from them from last summer. They just got turned on like October last year. But we really need them like out on Queens Boulevard and, um, you know, out on Flatbush Avenue and in different parts of town and out on like the bike path that runs, you know, along the Shore Parkway under the Verrazano and along, you know, Jamaica Bay. And I think we'll get there, but I think we should also be doing more, um, more systematic, you know, hand, hand counts. The, the, you know, the city used to just pay people to sit up on the bridges with clickers, and we can still do that to get more. Um, and the city does some counts in corridors when they're working on a project, but those aren't sort of systematically stored or presented anywhere. Um, and I think we should just do, be doing more surveys. You know, a lot of the surveys that we've seen in the past are very, very broad brush, like how many, you know, how, how many New Yorkers use a bike like once a month. Um, and we could do, we could do better. Um, and certainly as the, you know, the working population of delivery cyclists has been exploding in the last few years, we should, we should get a more accurate count of like how many, what, what percentage of bike traffic is, are those guys representing and just, just get a better sense of it. You know, some of the surveys say recreational cycling is still, the, you know, the most, the greatest use of that. And I think that's great. And, and you know, one of the things I, I think the city should be messaging more is that, look, a protected bike lane is not just a commuter tool or, or something for somebody going 15 miles on a bike, but it's also a community asset and a place you can take your kids. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's almost like a, a linear park in a lot of respects. And we ought to be sort of talking about the different uses those things can serve as well, you know, in, in, in sort of promoting them. Um, you know, but that's all getting aside from, you know, what we were seeing New Yorkers do this year. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated to look at this fall and, and see, you know, what's going on as we start to reopen a little bit, will the commuter re routes come back? Um, um, I, don't, I don't know, I suspect the community, cycling in communities will, um, you know, will continue to sort of predominate because I think the commuter market is going to come back very slowly. Um, so New York did do some pop-ups after the mayor announced those things in June, or at least they announced the pop-ups. Um, you know, look, I'm very proud to have worked at, at New York City DOT. I, I admire many of the people who are there doing the work still, um, but I was very embarrassed for the city when it did this program with these very sparsely um, spaced traffic barrels because you know, this is actually designated as a pop-up bike lane, but you can see the mail trucks, the pickup truck, the one barrel on the street of West 38th. Um, and some of them worked better than others, especially where um, the bike lane didn't fight parking. Um, but in, you know, this is Crescent Street in Astoria leading onto the Queensboro Bridge. People just moved the barrels and kept doing what they're doing. And this is gonna be a challenge. This, this, this block will be a challenge even for the permanent bike lane that's planned here and, and under construction. Um, because it's, you know, again, we, we have trouble building actual barriers to cars in, in New York and keeping them out of our bike lanes. But this, this program was not, you know, not the city's finest hour. And this was even just tweeted last week or, you know, a couple days ago about someone had taken all the barrels out of the Second Avenue gap where there's very heavy car traffic and heavier all the time as people start to drive more. Um, and, ridden, you know, basically ridden a family off the road. Um, this is not okay. This is not a good a good way to honor all the New Yorkers who are trying to use bikes and and do the right thing in our city. Um, you know, I think what the city has done mostly in the second half of the summer is sort of move on from the failed pop-ups and try to stand up its regular bike lane creation program. So we are seeing um, a lot of bike lane implementation right now. And the ones that are best, again, as I said, are the tried and true parking protected lanes. This one is Flatbush Avenue looking north with Prospect Park to your left, um, Brooklyn Botanic Garden to your right. This was actually a 2019 project that just didn't get done and got held over. So we're very far behind on the city's pipeline of projects. Central Park West was another one of those, which is just, you know, now getting its finishing touches, um, you know, minus some pieces that I'd like to see. 
Um, city says it will still do 25 miles of protected bike lane permanently this year. Um, I think that may prove to be a little bit ambitious, but it's good to hear. Um, but again, as I said, our bike lane network is very disconnected from the point of view of somebody who wants to be able to get around with, you know, protection from traffic for most of the trip. And the idea of the pop-up bike lanes was to try to fill in those gaps. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a few other efforts that the city is making. One is it declared a, a system of, uh, or a set of five busways that it would, pr you know, put into place this summer, early fall. One of them is on J Street. And so the idea was really restrict car, uh, passenger cars on J Street um, in downtown Brooklyn, which is, you know, a key network route to the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges. And we'll event, you know, we'll start to um, be connected by uh, protected bike lanes coming up from so further south in Brooklyn, like Fourth Avenue. Um, not yet quite. Um, so far, J Street's been in for a couple of weeks. I went once. The bike lane part still had all these, you know, bureaucrat cars parked in it. So not unfamiliar. The good news is J Street doesn't have a lot of cars during the pandemic. Um, maybe somewhat fewer with the restrictions put in place. So you can ride through there pretty peace, you know, peacefully. But um, this should work better. If we're going to be restricting cars, we ought to be able to make it for bikes. Um, the city was going to do this on Fifth Avenue in Midtown from 59th to 34th Street. Um, it punted on the busway part of it uh, a week or two ago. Still planning to do protected bike lanes on Fifth Avenue, which was a new development. There was no plan for that. So we're, you know, so you know, we're seeing some, you know, some progress there on you know, a downtown route to pair with the Sixth Avenue uh, protected bike lane, which is just being finished up now. Um, but, you know, again, I thought the busways were a nice idea for preserving the low traffic environment, which we saw in the spring and the early summer, and which um, was encouraging so many people to use bikes. I don't know that we're gonna preserve a lot of that in town under current efforts. And, uh, you know, look, the DOT heard the criticism of the pop-up bike lanes with the movable barrels. And they're trying a new model now. This is 61st Street, connecting the Queensboro Bridge to Central Park. This was just put in in the last week or so, with the um, you know the sort of uh, flex flex posts. And you know, look, this seems to be working better. This has always been a no stopping curb, so I think that helps a lot. We'll see if this model works in other places. Um, but you know, we do know from uh, you know years of experience that. New York City drivers will just drive over these flex posts at some point and park there. Um, so, you know, again- but, 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 but I would just jump in and say, I love this picture because it shows the dedicated bike lane with the flex, flex post right in front of the brass railed canopy of the building where, you know, if this had gone to the community board, that building's management you know, firm or its co-op board would have weighed in and said, oh no, you can't do this because people need to be dropped off right in front of number 52 or six or whatever it is there on the canopy. There's no way you can possibly have a bike lane there, but it was just done without going to the community board, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. And this is probably like Lexington and Fifth, I mean, Lexington and 61st. Um, so yeah, absolutely. But they will go to the community board and sort of, you know, talk this out at some point, um, but they will at least have some accumulated experience to present. The city doesn't need the community board's approval to do these things. And a lot of the, you know, the more ambitious protected bike lanes like Queens Boulevard that the de Blasio administration has put in have been over the objections of community boards. Um, so hopefully they won't engage in a lot of nonsense and they will just make this permanent. Um, you know, but look, we, we need to see these in a lot of places. I mean, I've, you know, I've lived in Greenpoint in the East Village and spent plenty of time in Central Park on a bike during my life. And, you know, this bike lane would have been great for me 25 years ago. It would have been great for me two years ago. Um, it's just a nice route now from Central, from the Queensboro Bridge to, to, to the park. Um, there isn't really a good connector back to the bridge because the other, the paired lane for this is 62nd Street, which, um, you know, isn't really well connected to the park. It kind of stubs out. It begins at a stub, you know, you could come down Fifth Avenue in traffic. Um, and I'm fine with that, but a lot of people aren't and a lot of would-be cyclists aren't. So I mean, we still have work to do, but look, this is, this is at least a response. Um, you know, but look, it's, it's New York. I mean, we saw 
basically one month of really low traffic deaths during the April lockdown. And now we're kind of back to business as usual where we're seeing 20 to 30 people killed per month in traffic. And um, more of them are, are cyclists in the last few weeks. Um, so we could actually rival last year's bad total in terms of bike deaths in the city, even, um, even as the world sort of takes to bikes and try, you know, tries to do more with bikes as resilient, sustainable, et cetera, et cetera, transportation. Um, it's not great. And, uh, you know, one of the things that maybe some of you will point out, but is pretty clear is that in, a, in you know, some of the examples I showed in Berlin, in London, in, um, in Paris, in some of the other places where we're seeing great things start to happen on streets like Seoul or Taipei, we just don't have a situation where the police department and law enforcement are so disconnected from the um, the policy goals of the city and, and of the citizenry. Um, and it's so very hard to, you know, to it, I, and frankly impossible to create a different sort of order on our streets if that's the case. Um, so that sort of brings me to, you know, a couple of concluding points. This is the mayor's detail um, from a press conference that was held in Astoria last week. And the entire detail parked in the Vernon Boulevard um, protected bike lane. You know, that's where we're at. Even when the mayor was responding to uh, to all the bike deaths last year, he still, each time he had a press conference about it, said it was okay to park, you know, for a few minutes in a bike lane, you know, if you had to make a drop off. You know, without, dry, uh, well, dry, without getting that, you know, that, dry that cleaning, one minute. Press can, conferences. Can, say, say dry, I say dry cleaning, press conferences, what yeah, have you. Mean. Anyway, it's called the de Blasio stop. And here is the... Uh, <laughs> Here's the mayor's detail doing it on mass. So look, I think, here's what I think. Um, I think because of the delayed pipeline of projects that, you know, look, the city did go through a hard time and they had many, many of city workers out, um, out of work and not efficient because of um, office shutdowns during the spring. That's also true of Milan, Paris and London, by the way. Um, we are behind. So we're very far behind on the bike, bike lane pipeline. The city had already announced by February a bunch of really good bike lanes that it was going to do in, um, in January and February. And so it's, it's doing some of those now. It's, as I said, finishing up some 2019 projects now. I think we have a pretty good sense of what we're going to get for the remainder of the de Blasio administration as far as bikes go. They're going to try to deliver the things they've announced. They'll, they will try to do some of the stuff they're under pressure to do in terms of pop-ups and network connectors and to try to minimize, you know, certainly the fatalities that we've been seeing this month already. Um, but I don't think we're gonna see some huge resurgence of bike parking or, um, you know, new, you know, new, a, a renewed sort of effort to control speeding, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, think, I think we're gonna get what we're gonna get. So I think in terms of de agenda development, our best sort of efforts in the next year are with the candidates who will be, one of whom will be elected to mayor in November and take office in January of 22. So look, I mentioned Corey Johnson, the Speaker of the City Council, you know, a very likely candidate for mayor. He's been, he's been fantastic throughout 2019 on these issues through 2020, um, forcing the city's hand on open streets and pop-up bike lanes. He speaks as if as someone who wants to see us do better and to lead the world on these things. Um, in the last couple months, um, Comptroller Scott Stringer has done a lot of the same. He, um, this is a press release from I don't know, a week ago, saying we're going back to school and we're not in the subways and buses. We ought to think about bikes. Um, I think it's a tall order what he called for, but we need to call for tall orders. We need to be ambitious, and we need to think of all the supportive systems they could actually support our kids riding bikes to school. He called for, um, you know, a, a big uh, attention to the bike network about a month earlier when he, when he and, and he couched it in terms of the, uh, the small business survival uh, strategy that he was putting together. And he said, look, people need to be able to get to these places and it's foot and bike traffic. They're gonna drive them this year and next year. Um, so I thought it was really interesting, you know, interesting framing. It's Something we found, we did research toward the end of my tenure at DOT, looking at tax receipts on streets that had seen traffic calming and bike uh, traffic improvements 
versus similar streets that didn't in the same neighborhood. And the, uh, the bike lane and et cetera, streets really outperformed uh, the other ones from, from a business point of view. It's a really good point. So we haven't heard from other candidates in large measure. Eric Adams is a, you know, bike supporter at times is, uh, you know, you know, a little difficult at times uh, with regard to, uh, you know, some proposals. So it's, you know, we, we need to get an agenda in front of everybody and we need to talk about the real systems behind things that are a problem. I don't think we can paint our way to bike friendliness, for example. I think we need to build more and I think we need to build a lot faster. Um, you know, there's a, there's a bike path being built on Flushing Avenue a few miles from where I'm sitting. And the, hand, the, the plans were handed off to the city's construction department like 12 years ago. And the project has taken like six to build and it's still not nearly done. Um, London and Paris are turning around things from idea to, you know, curb separated big wide bike, bike lanes in two to three years. And we need to study what they're doing and figure out a way to do it in New York. I think street reconstruction is every bad, bit as bad as, um, you know, improvements to the MTA. It just doesn't cause, you know, rush hour to collapse when it has a problem in the same way as the subway does. So it's under the radar. But we need to be talking to the candidates about those things. We need to be talking about secure bike parking. And we need to talk about how we get um, the police harnessed to the actual goals of the city so that they, they support it rather than thwart it. So they're not parking in every bike lane in sight and making excuses for people who run us over. Um, so I think it's still an open question, as I said. Um, will we become a real bike city? Look, we've made progress. Um, there's a really big city bike expansion plan underway. Did sit on the mayor's desk for almost all of 2018. Um, but it's it's out now and it's happening. So um, I think we still, we still have this question. New Yorkers have shown what it takes to get them on bikes. Safe streets, that's that's really it. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's my piece. And uh, I get that you guys may not like narrow protected bike lanes, but um, <laughs> They are, um, they are creating uh, a big generation of new bicyclists in the city. And, uh, you know, we can do better on our bridges as we did on the Pulaski Bridge. People are calling for more space on, you know, our capacity constrained bridges now, especially Brooklyn and Queens Borough Bridges. Um, there's a lot of issues here and there's a lot of things we need to grapple with to, uh, to really make this work uh, sort of deep deep city um, kind of changes that we need to make. And, um, you know, thank you for listening because I think the more people who are aware of those, the better we're gonna be and the smarter questions and, and um, you know, statements we're gonna make to our candidates next year because it's really in their hands. London has a mayor who gets this stuff. Paris has a mayor who gets this stuff. Berlin has a city government administration that gets this stuff. And you don't get it in a good way without that. Thank you so much, John. I, you know, I, I love those series of slides that you put together and to, to kind of rehearse where we went through the pandemic because, and I'm going to just take like the moderator's prerogative and pose a question or two of my own for you because I'm always enlightened by your thoughts whenever I get to ask you questions. And it just seems to me that transportation and public space as a result of the pandemic have risen or should have risen to the very top of every urban agenda right beneath public health, right beneath mask wearing, right beneath testing and contact tracing should be management of transportation, streets, and, and public space, because really it's controlling the circumstances under which random members of the public interact with each other, otherwise known as traffic. And if you manage traffic in a way that minimizes infection, you've, you've gone a long way. And, and, and what that means is not necessarily boxing people up in buses or subways, which may not have the air exchange or the amount of space around people that allows to protect against social distancing, but you can have personal rapid transit by well-managed and, and a robust, you know, alternative transportation infrastructure. And some cities have recognized this and have just gone for it. Why, why don't we have that here in New York right now? I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I think just understanding the physical city the way you described it is something that's always been a real weak part, point for this mayor. 
And I think I think what happened with say those barrel pop up bike lanes was the this DOT's bike unit was said sure go ahead and try these pop up bike lanes but it's kind of on you to pull it off and I saw you know planners and office workers out putting the barrels up um, so it, there was no there was no sort of push from the top to say this is all hands on deck I mean even within DOT like right now you see you know, you see a, you know, you see a little bit of street resurfacing, you see some bridge work. There's no, there's no real sense of priority for this stuff as you, as you described. I mean, I think what you described is exactly right. Those should have been the priorities. That's why our letter from March described like 30 bike links that we wanted to see on the street. And we didn't think that was outrageous. We didn't, you know, you never think you're going to get everything. And some of those appeared in the mayor's later pop-up um, announcements, some, but many of which would have seen no action, even though they were now seen no action today in mid-September, even though they were announced in May. Um, so there's just, there is not that sort of all hands on deck approach to that part of that, that aspect of the city that you're seeing. And look, the city DOT also was then quickly, you know, within two weeks was told to stand up a, an open streets program and then later a street dining program. So I understand why they're strapped, but what I don't understand is why a city government with an $80 billion operating budget can't find more people to help with this or, or pull people off some things that might be nice to have, like street resurfacing during a pandemic, and put them on this. Because I can think of a previous DOT commissioner who I know would have been driving a convoy of trucks around every DOT yard in the city and grabbing every barricade in every yard and then getting on the phone and demanding that other agencies give her the barricades that they had, and, and doing and doing this for must be talking about Iris Weinshaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it might be an obscure reference for some people, but yeah. Um, um, and that was true. I mean, that's what we did after Hurricane Sandy. We had convoys of city trucks from every department taking the food to the places that didn't have electricity. You know, and that's we just haven't seen that kind of. Uh, you know, we've seen it from the medical industry, but not not really from the physical management of our city. And um, but I think we are seeing that in some of these other examples. And that's why it was kind of astonishing that we did so poorly on this, and that we're continuing to struggle. I think um, because it seems like you know the city is trying to sort of do do its ordinary stuff and not the uh, not respond to the extraordinary. Then I've just got to ask you this follow-up question. I, as an attorney involved in representing cyclists um, in motor vehicle collisions and in other types of cases, um, in a ver variety of cases, it implicates city government. Sometimes city government didn't maintain the road properly. Sometimes city government owns cameras that capture video showing drivers striking cyclists. So during the pandemic, my mission often has been to go to city agencies that have control of these video cameras or other information about road hazards to um, with emergency applications to get them to preserve that video so that we can use them in civil cases on behalf of cyclists and part of that process as a lawyer has been to go to city agencies and actually find city lawyers who, who in person will receive legal documents. And I have to say that, that my conclusion is that city workers have not gone back to work. City offices have not reopened. Very few city workers are actually working except from home and there's a huge barrier between you know when you're at home and working from home and actually getting work done. And um, that's my perception of what's going on at DOT. And you know, I, I, I just, I, it, it seems to me that in other cities around the world, part of the pandemic response is that everyone has taken this, as you call it, all hands on deck approach and treat it as an emergency. What we've seen in New York City from the top is an attitude of like, everybody, it's time to settle in and shelter in place. Take care of your family and well, wear I mean, a mask look, I, I know when British, and if I, you go out. <laughs> I, know, I know British planners who are also sheltering in place under stronger lockdown rules than we had. 
and they're working from home, but, but the key is on the street and they're out there when it's time to project manage, they're doing the barricade installation along with their, you know, their work crews and the work crews are on the street and that's safe and we can do that. So the, the key is getting people to come back to that work. And there is, look, there is, you know, there are, there are constraints and I've heard some of this stuff. Like if you're designing a street on AutoCAD, your home computer may not have access to that. So there, is, there are a lot of inefficiencies and things like that. But um, again, I don't think you want to design the street on AutoCAD. I think you don't want to just take a truckload of barriers out there right now and find the space. And, and having defined the space in the low traffic period, those cities are way ahead of us and they will be for years as a result. Okay, I've just recognized Miles Lewis who posed a question. He was asking about some of these deferred or current bike lane projects in Queens. He mentioned Queens Boulevard. Um, we just heard some news recently today about Northern Boulevard. I mean, Queens is a borough where these giant traffic sewers, Queens Boulevard, Northern Boulevard, Atlantic Avenue, et cetera, are the only efficient means for getting out past the, you know, the sections that immediately adjoin Manhattan. And if we're going to stimulate bicycle as a transportation mode out in Queens and in, in, in central and eastern Queens, we're going to do it by creating infrastructure on these giant, you know, roadways that I guess for historical reasons just lead right into Manhattan, right onto the bridges, right, right where you'd want them to go, you know, but don't have the infrastructure and in fact are boulevards of death. So with that sort of background, Miles, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute and I'm going to ask you to ask your question because with the group like we have tonight, it's, there's every reason for you to just pose it yourself. But since I've asked him to unmute and he hasn't, I'll just read it. Could you talk about the delayed continuation of Queens Boulevard bike lane from Jewel Avenue and Forest Hills to Kew Gardens, why there can't be parking barriers that prevent cars from entering the bike lanes like other cities have? Is there a reason? <laughs> yes, I mean, there's those two things. So first, the, the continuation or extension eastward of the Queens Boulevard bike lane. And look, I will say, I think one of the greatest accomplishments for the bike network that has happened under de Blasio has been sinking these big, long protected bike lane corridors from, you know, more or less the East River down, out, into, out into the middle of Queens and Brooklyn, namely Queens Boulevard, and now in Brooklyn Fourth Avenue, which still doesn't connect up to the downtown or the waterfront well, but hopefully could someday. Um, but Queens Boulevard, that sort of additional section going east is a special case that was held up, you know, by the mayor, as I'm sure you know, for political reasons. And it was caught up with the council member out there, Karen Kozlowitz, and the, the, you know, the big fight over the post Rikers Island jail that they were trying to build in that vicinity. Um, and it kind of got traded for the jail, um, basically, if you want to cut it short. Um, and we were hoping, that the, as I said, the city uh, Commissioner Trottenberg made announcements in January and February about the big slates of protective bike lanes that the DOT was going to do this year in Manhattan and Brooklyn, and they had not gotten to other borough announcements before we started going into the lockdown or shelter in place rules. And so those things were never announced. We don't know what was in the pipeline for this year. Queens Boulevard has been designed since probably 2017. You could pull it off the shelf anytime and do it. But um, it's City Hall's call, not DOT, because City Hall pulled the rug out from under it right before construction was supposed to start um, two years ago. So we don't know. That's the answer. Um, what is going on in Queens that we do know about right now is a protective bike lane on Crescent Street. I showed you the barrels on the sidewalk there on the last block at Queens Plaza North. Um, some of it's parking protected. It was working well as a pop-up. The parts that weren't parking protected were not working well as pop-ups and may not work well unless we have a really good barrier um, sort of toward the bridge end of the, of the street. Um, and as Steve mentioned, um, the DOT is working now on Northern Boulevard. That is one of the pop-ups that was announced back in June. Um, and so it was not subject to community review. Um, they're doing something and I, I'm curious to see what it is because so far all that's gone in is paint and nobody's gonna bike on Queens Boulevard who's not already willing to do it um, just because there's some paint. 
because it's, you know, as Steve said, it's just like a nasty, you know, it's like a Long Island, um, you know, it's like Route 25 out in Long Island. It's like car dealerships and malls and lots and lots of curb cuts and just unbelievable amounts of traffic. So um, if we get Jersey barriers or something, that I think will be cool. And that will be, again, another great new model pop up with a, with a real barrier that um, will allow it to work. And, um, you know, and again, that, you know, that leads right down into Queens Plaza North. And so it could be a very busy route um, for people using the bridge. Um, so we're hopeful. I mean, you know, the other fight we've been having for a couple of years is getting a second lane on the Queensboro Bridge so bikes and pedestrians are not all jammed down into the same 10 feet together, even as bridge traffic sort of booms this year. City hasn't been willing to go out and just say, let's just try it because we can. Um, they keep raising all kinds of objections. And I, I think, look, I think the, I think the commissioner listens to technical staff um, who are reluctant to do things rather than pushing them and challenging them. And I think that's what's going on with the bridges. And, you know, one of the points you mentioned that bears a little bit of amplification is that, you know, Karen Koslowitz, the local city council member, played a role in the delay. Um, whether, yeah, it had to do, whether it had to do with prisons or concerns about bicyclists or what have you, um, this is a very important city or municipal election cycle that we're going into in 2021. And um, the bicycle forces, which have flexed their muscle in the electoral context in years past, uh, are, looking to do, are looking to do so again, um, notwithstanding the fact that we're discussing this on you know, all of these different 501c3 channels. Um, we're all aware that there are electoral politics that go on and the role that they play in smoothing the way for good sound policy arguments. It's like good sound policy arguments are great, but they're not enough, right? <laughs> no, you have to have the power as well as the argument. That's the argument. I, 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 would, I would say that's really important. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift gears and, so, and, and show you something. I, when, you, when you called to ask me, how do I log into this Zoom at like, you know, 628, um, today, I was actually on the phone with a reporter from the Daily News who was running by me something that I had heard about only yesterday, which is a proposal that we will be seeing most likely tomorrow in the news about, quote unquote, decriminalizing jaywalking. I don't know if you've heard about this, but uh, there is a proposal likely to be introduced by a city council member from Queens that would say that pedestrians are not forced to use crosswalks to cross the street, that they may cross at any point along the street. They are warned and advised that doing so may subject them to the dangers and the risks of injury or worse from vehicular traffic. And they are advised that they should be um, yielding the right of way, um, but that it is no longer illegal for pedestrians to cross the street outside of a crosswalk or against a traffic signal is sort of how I interpret this proposed anti, this jaywalking decriminalization legislation. And, um, you know, I'll just tell you for starters what my view is. My view is number one, it, it's very hard for me as a cyclist to say, yeah, I'm in favor of it because I really don't like the way pedestrians, runners and other people on foot disrespect cyclists take away, steal our right of way, walk right in front of us because they know we can't hurt them the way a car would. They know that we're as vulnerable as they might be, I think in many cases and are willing to play chicken with us. But as much as I would like to keep pedestrians in their place, I can't help but feel that this is an historic moment to turn the tide back to the 1920s or 30s when motor vehicles first arrogated to themselves the public roadways, which for centuries before had been the exclusive province of non-motorized modes. So now this is up. We're gonna, you know, it's a, it's a century old policy that we have of motor vehicles run the roadways. Now we're gonna take it away. We're gonna say that pedestrians can cross anywhere they want. What do you think, John? Um, I'm all for it. I mean, people do anyway. So. Why leave it, you know, to this, you know, and it's very, very, very seldom enforced. So it is, it is really just something that, um, you know, would be a completely 
discretionary and very actually extraordinary measure taken by a police officer to sort of impose on somebody. Um, so I don't, we, I don't, I, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's great. I think we should, you know, we should have some similar stuff for, uh, I don't know what, but. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. And Ed Raven, who I just recognized uh, allowed to talk, has pointed out that this is in order to, um, it, it's more about police using jaywalking as a pretext to arrest people who they want to arrest for some yeah. other reason anyway, which I, I agree that, you know, I was told by the Daily News reporter I was speaking to just before we got on here that there were 347 jaywalking summonses issued last year. Yeah, so less than one a day. Tiny, tiny, tiny handful of the summons, of the traffic summonses issued, you know, in New York City. So really negligible. Um, I think it's used because, you know, in, in many cases, because the officer doesn't know what else to write. And as we know, as cyclists, officers will write, if they really want to ticket someone, they'll come up with a reason to ticket someone and they'll issue the ticket. It could be that you're bicycling without a helmet, even though you're an adult and a non-commercial <laughs> cyclist. It could be, you know, that you're, you're not on the right-hand side of the street, even though there's a bike lane on the left-hand side of the street. I mean, I've seen it all. Um, you'll get ticketed if that cop wants to ticket you. Um, but if this, this law were to change, it would dramatically change the rights and obligations of motorists. I mean, I, I think that if it, if it were implemented in, in a civil litigation context, it would really shift the balance of who ends up bearing the risk of a car on pedestrian collision in terms of who pays for the pedestrians medical bills, pain and suffering, things of that nature. Um, right now, if a pedestrian crosses mid-block, you know, you've really, you, you don't have much. You can get some nuisance value out of it. I'm speaking as a personal injury lawyer. I've done these cases. You know, if this law were to be changed this way, it's really much more of a European system where it's like, you have to make sure you don't hit people, period, if you're driving a car. Period. I think it's great. I, I, I love it because drivers are so unaccountable now. Anything that increases it is good. I'd like to, I'd like to I'd see like to, bike, bikes on sidewalks decriminalized as well because, again, it's something where it's less than one ticket a day. It's not, it's not something that's meeting a need. It's something that's used in very, you know, very particular circumstances. Why don't you go ahead and join, Ed? What do you have to say? I, um, I would point out that bicyclists got a similar... Um, uh, favor in the law done to us uh, a couple of years ago when they decriminal they allowed uh, us to follow the walk signal instead of the red light so we could take advantage of the lean pedestrian intervals. And I spoke when I spoke to Can Councilman Reynoso about this, and he said one of the biggest reasons that he wanted this law to pass was because of minority bicyclists getting stopped by the cops for doing something that ought to be legal anyway. So I'm glad to see that the same philosophy is being uh, expanded to pedestrians. Uh, but the underlying problem is still that we have a police department in New York City that's basically predatory on uh, on minorities, on 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 bicyclists, on pretty much everybody who they're, they're not who's not in the car, who they're not fond of at the moment. And uh, dickering with laws like this is not is not solving that problem. Well, I mean that's a really interesting point. And again, I have to ask John, and I'm putting you on the spot, but why is it that? What is the reason for the historical antagonism between NYPD and bicyclists in New York City? I, look, I, I don't know. I think it's some of it is cultural, and you know, the, they tend the cops tend to come from you know parts of the region that are more car oriented. Um, I mean. And I think they come from parts of the region because they were more car oriented. I think like doing crazy bad things with cars is fairly normal to cops, whereas bicycling through a crowded environment um, with a bunch of drivers and drivers look like they're major the majority in New York, even though they're not, it's just because they take up all the space. Um, you just, there's sort of a cultural bias against it. I mean, it's not, it's not universal. I've, I've raced bikes with cops. Uh, I, you know, I, you know, we've had cops in various recycle a bike and bike New York 
programs working with kids who have been fantastic, you know, people and good, good, good uh, instructors and mentors as bike riders. But, um, you know, that's not really the predominant culture. And, I, you know, and, and, but I, and I think the sort of the antagonism people that, that they feel for cyclists is very clear in the way they just blatantly park in bike lanes all the time. And that a commander will never, you know, it's very rare. I think there's a couple of precinct commanders who try to stop that, but even they're up against a, a very difficult culture. So I, you know, I think one of the smartest questions we can ask of candidates is how do you expect to attain safe streets in the city if, if we don't, if you're not controlling the police and you haven't aligned the police with your policies? Because de Blasio has utterly failed at that. There were many of us who worked on creating the Vision Zero policy. I stayed around the administration for six months after Bloomberg left, who naively thought that this was, that Vision Zero was the way to get the police integrated into this because they were one of the three departments tasked with producing the policy. And it definitely has not happened. And it's, you know, they they basically sort of, you know, you, you know, like the old West uh, buildings with the, the fake second floor, they've sort of propped up a, an edifice around Vision Zero at the police department, but they don't practice it and they don't, you know, it's not taken to heart. If anything, you know, during the pandemic, what we've seen is a withdrawal from the police of traffic even, enforcement. Which even they more never so really than, even more so than and then also the barricading of the precinct houses, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, look, we have we have a lot less people moving around um, and even and even less cars moving around in a lot of parts of town. But I think we may have more traffic fatalities this year um, because people are using this space to speed and like almost every neighborhood is reporting a drag racing problem and a, you know, just like a muscle car idiot behavior problem. And there's nothing going on to combat that. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned um, a little bit about your interface with NYPD at Bike New York and, you know, of all the organizations in the bike space in New York City, uh, you've been involved in all of them, of course, <laughs> over the years and decades. Um, bike New York has always partnered closely with uh, NYPD over its signature event, the Five Row Bike Tour, but it also has other programs that are a little bit less known. Um, that that have you know worked with NYPD in different different ways in different cases and I I just want to observe that I mentioned in the chat that Bike New York where your communications director um, has an event a month long event called Spoketober or you could call it Spooktober maybe to get the Halloween moment in there um, but in any event um, I have shared the link in the chat and I'd urge you all to go there to see. Um, the events and the programming that Bike New York is planning for there. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit from you, John, about how you, in, in your position as communications director, um, are working to sort of position and develop Bike New York's role in this bike advocacy space compared to, say, where things were 10 years ago. Well, a lot of it's been really trying to sort of dig in and look at some of the particular, for me, the particular policy problems and those sort of deep city institutional problems that um, like a group that's working across like bike, bus, pedestrian safety issues just isn't going to focus on as much and isn't necessarily aware of because they may not have the city government experience, but it, like this issue of emergency vehicles and street sweepers requiring every bike lane in New York that has a barrier to be 11 feet wide. That has, that has big implications. Like if, if some of these bike lanes were only seven feet wide, you couldn't really drive a car down it and that would be good. Or you could stick a, if you wanted it to be 12 feet wide, you could stick a post at the end of it and a skinny street sweeper could get in there, but nothing else could and that would be good. We don't have street, skinny street sweepers. And I want sanitation to buy them and I've been working with a bunch of council members on that, but it's it's sort of one of these like oddball issues where the sanitation department or the size of our fire trucks is dictating street design, and it's not you know it's not just hollering at DOT for more miles of bike lanes. It's fixing something that DOT exactly itself can't fix. It needs to be fixed at a higher level, either through legislation 
or legislative pressure or by the mayor themselves. Um, I think this issue of, uh, you know, trying to paint our way to bike friendliness has kind of run its course and we need to, we need to build stuff that cars can't get in. Um, if we really want to create a, a huge generation of people riding bikes um, and we need, we can't just say we're going to do protected bike lanes under vision zero and neglect bike parking. So I've been trying to bring a lot of these issues to the fore and, you know, I, I wish I was working with people in city hall on the mayor side, but I'm working with people on the council side um, because they're interested and they're, and they're receptive to this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they really aren't been the policy reform focus in the city under, under this mayor. So, you know, I'm hopeful in those regards and, um, you know, belying sort of my like long-term presence in this space, um, it's younger people, younger officials who get this stuff like quickly. So having a council speaker in his thirties, having a sanitation committee chair in the council in his thirties, those things really make a huge difference because they're just like, why are we doing this? This is insane. Um, and you know, you see all these community fights over bike lanes and, and the like are very, very generational. Mm -hmm. um, so you have, so I, and I, and I think the fact that we have, you know, very changing, changing makeup of elected officials is one of the things that's really, you know, going in our favor. We're getting like young politicians from Bay Ridge and we will get a young politician from Kew Gardens, unlike the current occupants. Um, and and that, will change the, that will change the conversation because those people, if they're willing to do it, they can frame the conversation and they can just say, look, community board, we're going to do this in some way, no more nonsense. And I'm not going to entertain all the usual crap. Um, and that changes it dramatically. And I, I saw that up front with council members who worked with me on City Bike, because we had a lot of the same nonsense come out when we were going to stick 100 stations in a district. And the ones who cut that off early um, made our lives so much better. And it wasn't, didn't take the mayor, it just took, took the lo local council members saying, this is happening, we're gonna do it. You can say how we're gonna do it, but you don't get to say no. And it makes a huge difference for somebody just to, to stand up to the, the loud mouths in their neighborhood to do that. But you'd agree with me that for us middle-aged bike advocates, that biking keeps us young at heart and makes us the natural allies of those younger leaders who are elected, who find themselves in positions of power due to charter revision and term limits and are out there running the various committees introducing oh, no, I, love those, I love those guys and i'm happy to i'm happy to work with and help any of them and, and also the, you know the young the younger advocacy groups and and people in those groups i mean that that's who has to make this stuff work and that's who's delivering the ground game on this stuff i mean bike new york employs me but they're not employing organizers to go out and do this stuff so um mm -hmm. you know that's it's, that's it's, who we as middle class cyclists, uh, middle middle class, middle age, middle class cyclists need to recognize our natural allies in this and, and how much we need to partner and support with them, even though they have some other interests and issues that are going on in terms of the police that may not be easily digestible. This is a moment for us to seize and an alliance uh, for us to seize. I think there are new people coming in who may not uh, make this their issue, but who we can have great conversations with. And there are plenty of people in every neighborhood in the city who want this and who are practicing it themselves. And um, they can be activated as constituents as well. I'm going to ask Neil uh, Weissman, I'm recognizing him here. I'm asking him to unmute. And he had an interesting question, more about the discrepancy between the bold proposals you see in European cities and um, and and the contrast between what's happening in New York. Neil, why don't, why don't you just articulate your question? Sure, sure. I was actually in the middle of um, uh, changing a chain, my recumbent, which if you can imagine is like trimming the nose hairs on an elephant. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is, um, I, I understand. I mean, I, I, I do look at London. I, I look at some of their, so their, so their, so their, so their, so their studies. I'm, I'm just in awe of some of the stuff that they put to get to get to. Um, on my website, uh, Complete Shores, there's a, there's a link called London. It actually links to about uh, a, 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 a 10 Neil, apps. Neil, you're having some about, kind of technical uh, audio to, problems. Like, sorry? You're, you're having some kind of technical. 
Yeah, there's some feedback. If you're having an input, just turn off all of your inputs, make them mute and inaudible, and then just state your question. How does, is, is this, uh, I turned off my speaker system. So if this is better, just put your thumb up. And I can't see you. All right, I don't have to see <laughs> It's good. Um, we, uh, Steve, let me come back to you in five, 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 in five. It's the weirdest glitch I've ever heard. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to read Neil's question because it was very articulate. So let me, uh, for Neil, I'm going to mute. I'm going to say, part of London's consensus to invest in cycling involved the wholesale support of the corporate community. They were behind this. New York City business community is, is taking de Blasio to task for failing to adopt their proposal for rebuilding the city. And we, we saw actually just this week, I mean, or maybe it was the weekend, the business community, Catherine Wilde, Partnership for New York, um, the chair uh, of the, my former employer, the law firm Debevoys and Plimpton, a lot of heavy hitters in New York City business community have come out and taken de Blasio for task for failing to adopt their proposal for rebuilding the city. And, you know, um, is there a role for cycling advocates, transportation policy people to try to foster this discussion between city government and Fortune 500 companies? Or do you, we really just wait for 18 months of, of you know, a current lame duck administration? To Steve, course. Steve, um, yeah. well, well done. Can I hire you to represent me? Um, <laughs> yes, but yeah. but no. The the idea. I think that I think it's critical. What what we look at at London is very much because the, the the business community said we want this to happen. We want our employees to be able to come to work on bun by. We want them to get there on time and safe. And we want to go to city and and the corporate community just like jump. Both feet, 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 feet down and said we want this to happen, and that has sustained through administration, you know, conservative, liberal, labor administrations, different mayors. It's kept going for twenty years. So I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess. Okay. Look here. Here's my. Here's my. Here's my. Here's my. My thoughts on that. And I, I have friends in London and and in um, different parts of the British, both advocacy and and sort of government. Uh, establishments, um, the, gra the grass is always greener. So London has a lot of the same stuff going on that we do um, when you were trying to take street space. London has a ruling class that's a global ruling class that does not want to give up its space to drive Jaguars and other things around a couple miles in the West End of London. <laughs> and in fact, the, the borough government of Westminster has been one of the worst on all these issues for years, as partly as a result of that constituency. Um, so, you know, in some ways, London is harder to do this stuff in because you got to get a couple different levels of government to cooperate. Um, but transport for London is big. It's like the MTA and the DOT put together here. And they generally attract the best and the brightest in the field, in the country. And they get really good stuff done. Um, I think the mayor of London has been more forceful about this, um, certainly than de Blasio, and that has helped. Sometimes it just if you signal like this is the mayor's issue and you're not going to mess with him, the corporate industry, the corporate um, folks will pick a different battle. But and and look, there have been businesses and and some parts of London that have fought bike lanes, not necessarily during the pandemic. But so look, you're right. The city of London, the financial district, is going you know whole hog with a lot of pedestrianization. They were the first to announce Vision Zero in the city. Um, and they're doing that stuff. And then, yeah, it's about making, making work. And I think, look, the business community responds, you know, to some degree to their customers and they need to compete for workers. And people in London have been taking the bikes in huge numbers for the last like five years. And it's obvious that that's happening in the city to everybody. And so you, you know, you want that look, you know, in New York, you know, we passed a, a, you know, bikes and buildings law in 2007, right before the collapse of the world economy last time around. Yeah. And the building industry didn't really fight it. They were like, yeah, we get it. We want, we're the real estate industry. We want customers. Um, and some of them went above and beyond. Um, and we're really great about it. Um, 
I think the proposal that the partnership and others, you know, sort of put out last week or whatever that was, was pretty vague. It was sort of like, you're not working on quality of life. And so I think people like Catherine Wild would support a better bike network. And I've, you know, I've worked with her in different ways over the years. And I think she as a business leader could bring people around to see transportation is critical. Um, you know, they wouldn't be the most jazzed at like, you know, quick pedestrianization of lower Manhattan, but I think we'll get there eventually. And I think, I, th I think there's a business case for all of this stuff. Stringer made it. I think Stringer wouldn't have done that without talking to people in, you know, in the smaller business community, you know, community that he was catering to there. But I, again, people get it. I mean, all those, all those, um, business groups are lobbying Congress desperately for transit aid right now because they know New York doesn't function around cars and their workforces aren't going to come back in cars, um, certainly not efficiently. So I don't see why not. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see them as an obstacle. And I think, again, they're, they're, they're in business. And, um, you know, we got to get people back into different establishments. We got to keep people in the city with a high quality of life. They all get that. All right. But I don't see um, the de Blasio administration coming together with them in the next year and a half. So yes, we are going to muddle yeah. through. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thumbs up on the lame duck. <laughs> thumbs up on banging our head against a brick wall that represents uh, an administration that we... Well, I would say put, put, put your energy into the candidates. Okay. My well, that's a, that's a great way to end. Um, Everyone who hears this live or recorded ought to be aligning their political activities um, and, and uh, enriching and expanding their political activities to reflect their views as cyclists, as city dwellers, and as people who'd like to see um, these transportation priorities rise to the top of the agenda as, as you know, common sense tells us in a pandemic they should be right after public health measures. Um, and I really appreciate your time, John, and effort in putting together the presentation, which was just really superb and provocative and stimulating and the question and answer afterwards. And uh, I think we're done for tonight. Cool, so thank, thank you guys, this was great. All right, good night. Take care.